Hello, everybody. Uh, John, thank you so much for inviting me. Really looking forward to this. And um, yeah, just like John said, um, I'm going to be kind of presenting um, 10 key trading lessons that I've kind of taken away from all the interviews I've done with uh, veteran traders, hedge fund managers, and uh, US investing champions. So first things first, uh, if you didn't know me, uh, if you don't know me already, uh, just a little bit of background on myself. As John said, I'm the host of the Market Chat and Trade Line podcast. Um, and these are a few of the interviews I've been able to do. Um, Stan Weinstein, Mark Minervini, David Ryan, Tom Basso, Oliver Kell, Jim Ropel. Um, and uh, at, as John said, I've, I've done about 50 over the past few years. And what's awesome is I think this is the best way to really shorten your learning curve is being able to ask these veteran traders questions. I learned so much and hopefully people uh, who, who watch it learn something as well. And I just want to say that throughout the presentation, if you have any questions, John, maybe you can kind of relay them to me or uh, we can kind of pause at certain points and take them as well. Uh, with that said, um, I think it's really cool to kind of put some of the interviews I've done on kind of this time frame chart here where um, over on the right is kind of the faster trading, day trading, swing trading. And as you go over to the left, you'll see the kind of longer term holders. Uh, Kathy Donnelly likes to use that 40 week moving average while all the way on the right, Tomas Claro, um, who is one of the top performers in the 2020 US Investing Championship, um, does a lot of intraday swing trading. And obviously uh, people fluctuate, there, there's some variation here, but this kind of gives you a general guide as to people's timeframes. So before we get into the actual topic of trading, I think sports really presents an amazing analogy to uh, a lot of the things that we hope to do as traders in terms of improvement, uh, process, all that. And uh, baseball is, is one of my favorites. I, I played uh, varsity baseball up to that point, um, pretty competitive there. And uh, hopefully there's some baseball fans in the audience here as well. Uh, of course, Boston, you got the Red Sox. I'm, I'm, a, I'm from uh, the DC area, so the Nats are my team. Uh, so this is the best hitter on the planet, Juan Soto. And what's great about sports is in order to really perfect it and, and master a skill, for instance, working on your swing, you want to go ahead and study the greats and learn from those people who have already been doing it for years and, and decades. And I've always found that that playing with people who are better than myself is the best way to speed up my learning curve. And that's kind of what I hope to do with uh, the Market Chat series. And you basically want to look at breaking down what makes an expert on something successful. What about their swing is repetitive? Uh, what, what makes it powerful? What makes it consistent? All of that stuff. And you also want to take a look at the routines, habits, technique, and also the hard work that these athletes put in and try to determine what makes them successful overall. And you got to do the mental, physical reps and uh, have that preparation, those routines, and also the right mindset as well. Um, and I think just like baseball, uh, training is exactly the same thing. You can look at those experts, um, the, those veteran traders, and try to find kind of the commonalities between them. And that's kind of what I'll share today in this presentation. So let me move the Zoom tools here. Uh, in order to trade like a champion, you have to train like a champion. So just like with sports, um, I found that uh, many of the people who I've interviewed have studied the best of the best, Jesse Livermore, uh, Nicola Starvis, um, William O'Neill, of course. And um, what's great about this time uh, and this age is that the pieces and, and the knowledge is out there on the internet, often for free. Uh, the books are a very cheap way to learn somebody's system. There's amazing books out there that we'll get to in just a few slides. Um, there's videos on YouTube. And there's just so much content out there that it's really easy to uh, learn from experts and have access to this type of knowledge instead of what doing what the pros had to do and, and search in libraries, read old books. Uh, it's a lot more accessible nowadays. And I think what's really important is when you're learning to trade, you got to focus inward. You want to compete with yourself uh, from one day, one month, one year ago, slowly improve. Um, I know everybody's on Twitter following people who have maybe been doing this for decades and, and they're so far ahead of them on the learning curve. And it might seem like that's so far out of reach, but you have to recognize the hard work that those traders put in to achieve that consistency, achieve that type of performance. And you just want to focus on yourself and just try to learn from your mistakes and just get a little bit better with every single trade, every single mistake. Um, and along with that, you want to make sure you're conducting post analysis, which means going back, looking at your trades. I know it's painful to analyze a loss, uh, but that's often where you're going to get those breakthroughs is you, you print out a chart, you, you mark up where you bought, where you sold, and just try to come up with rules 
uh, to just do a little bit better, suck a little bit less the next time. And we'll get into that a little bit more later on in the video. And uh, I think this is probably extremely important. Nothing matters unless you commit to learning regardless of your strategy. So if you're a value buyer, if you're a swing trader, a day trader, a position trader, nothing matters if you commit to one single system, just focus on that, become the best you can be. And then maybe when you've mastered one, you can move on and kind of add different tools to your toolbox. But uh, the most important thing is that you have to commit to learning and really have a passion for this in order to succeed. All right. So with that beginning said, let's go on over to lesson one, which is trading takes patience and hard work. We've of course got William O'Neill in the picture over here on the right. And every one of the traders I've interviewed struggled for years before really finding their footing, their style, and uh, basically their strategy of trading. And to achieve better results, they went back and studied some of the best traders in history, just like I was talking about. And as I said, focus on one specific style and time frame. became a specialist. And they didn't necessarily copy William O'Neill's exact uh, methodology. They didn't necessarily copy Nicholas Darvis uh, to a T either. They made those strategies uh, their own, picked you know bits and pieces from this one, that one, and combined it to form their own methodology that fit with their, their personality, their lifestyle, uh, their routines, their habits, all of that. And many of them read very similar books, Darvis, O'Neill, Livermore, Mark Douglas, Minervini, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. As I said, a lot of that information is already out there um, and easily accessible on the internet um, or also in video form. Uh, so here are some recommended books um, to continue lesson one. Uh, once again, you got to put in the work. Uh, reading these will give you an amazing foundation and really reinforce a lot of the key things that you need to know as a as a successful stock trader. So in terms of books, How to Make Money in Stocks by William O'Neill, How I Made $2 Million in the Stock Market, Nicholas Darvis, How to Trade in Stocks, Jesse Livermore, Reminiscences of Stock Market Operator, Edwin Lefebvre, and Secrets for Profiting in Bull and Bear Markets by Stan Weinstein. I think if you just read these over and over again, um, as, as well as Mark Minervini's books, I highly recommend those two. Um, that will give you an amazing foundation and really cement um, the key principles that you need to know to make sure you're managing risk properly as well as buy and sell properly as well. And uh, as I mentioned, you can also watch videos, webinars. And I think this is a big key, especially if you're just starting out, you want to go ahead and write training rules and cement kind of your overall methodology. You want to work through, you know, what, what does market, market analysis look like? Uh, how am I going to select stocks? What are my entry points? What are my exit points? How am I managing risk in the situation? How am I going to handle earnings? You want to think about all these different decisions you have to make um, in advance and outline your routines so all that preparation comes together and you know it's all about execution at the end of the day if you have those rules written out it's a lot easier to fall back on those and uh, just execute your system than in the moment just kind of react based on emotion and what's going on in the market itself you got to outline your rules and it's not going to be a final set um, I think that's key. It's always going to be a work in progress. People are working on their training rules all the time, but it's important to have that base out there, that foundation to fall back on. And it's basically a place to start. You're, it's never going to be a final product, as I said. Um, it's just it's just a starting point. So lesson two is stay positive, stay focused, and stay disciplined. And of course, uh, if you guys know this guy over here, Jim Ropel, he's kind of the epitome of this, staying positive. Um, and it, it's important to remember that it pays to be a bull over the long term. If you look at a monthly chart of the indexes, it goes from left, uh, the bottom left hand corner to the top right corner. Um, it pays to be a bull over the long term. The, in the long term, the market goes up and you want to make sure that you're treating setbacks as learning moments. I think this is kind of a key kind of uh, mental shift that you have to make. Um, it sucks to lose money. Stop loss hits are going to hurt, uh, but it's important to remember that any setback, any losing trade, any mistake that you made can be learned from. And it's all about just getting a little bit better with each trade, uh, doing that post analysis, rewriting your rules based on your experience and just getting a little bit better. So, you know, maybe one year from now, uh, you're a little bit better at handling this particular situation uh, that, that you lost, lost money unnecessarily one year ago. It's just getting a little bit better and comparing yourself to, you know, your previous versions and uh, just seeing that improvement overall. Also, as I've said a couple of times here, you want to go ahead and stick to one strategy and become a specialist, become a master at that particular method slash setup. 
Uh, you want to commit to learning to that setup and become the best you can be. If you want to be a great swing trader, focus on that first. Then maybe if, uh, you know, there's a 2020 that comes around, a big correction and trends are lasting longer, then you can kind of open up uh, and, and try to learn more tools. But at first, you want to focus and specialize at one particular method and setup and become the best you can be at that. Um, and I think this is really important. You want to judge your trading based on whether you execute your plan and process, not whether you made money or lost money on a trade. So what this means is, is if you look back at a trade and you, it was a loser, that doesn't mean it was necessarily bad trading. In fact, if you followed your rules and practice good risk management, that was probably a great trade. So grade yourself based on your process, your execution of your plan, not on the end result of the trade. Um, even bad execution can lead to a profit. So keep that in mind and make sure that you're looking and working towards a process that's going to be sustainable, consistent in different market environments and judge yourself based on uh, your execution, not the end result of the trade. I think that's really important. Uh, so continuing on with lesson two, stay positive, stay focused, stay disciplined. Um, I think it's really important to take some time each day and reflect on how it went. How was your execution? Did you execute your daily routine properly? Uh, did you have a focus list coming into the day? Um, how were your alerts, alert, alert levels set? How, um, how did you react to the day's events? Did you follow your plan? And you got to make sure you're following both your weekend and those daily routines to really prepare for each day and each week. And I think this is also another key thing. Try to avoid the noise as much as possible. Um, Twitter, I think, is a fantastic resource, but you have to use it the right way. Um, if your process is based on waiting for some trader on Twitter to, to tweet that they're buying the stock uh, right there, uh, one, that's not going to be sustainable. What happens if they you know, stop tweeting? And two, you're probably going to get a really bad entry because by the time they post it, the stock could already be up five, eight percent from that entry point. So you have to think about trading in a way that if you just were stuck in a room, closed off from all social media, you just had an internet connection, your charting software, uh, your broker over here, uh, you should be able to execute just based on that. Uh, Twitter, I think, is great for you know interacting with other traders, learning at the end of the day, uh, but you don't want to rely on it and you don't want to have it open too much so it distracts you during the actual trading day when it's it's supposed to be just about execution execution of your trade, uh, your trading plan. Um, also that comes with other traders as well. You wanna make sure that um, if you're a swing trader, uh, it, you can 100% learn a lot from a position trader, but in the moment when you're actually trade trading and, and trying to develop a plan, you wanna focus uh, on traders who have a similar uh, time frame to you. Um, and I think this is a really important reminder here, say no to FOMO. Uh, never take a trade just because somebody's posting about it on social media. Uh, that's, that's often going to lead to bad risk management and entering a stock that's already extended. All right, so lesson three is stay in tune with your own trading. Uh, many of the traders who I've interviewed uh, suggest keeping a journal, a mental picture of how recent trades have performed, and you want to go ahead and take that feedback into account and let that translate over to your action. So I've got this graphic over here, action, effect, feedback. You wanna allow all that feedback to then kind of orient it and guide your actions. So for instance, if you see multiple failed breakouts and leaders, you're stopped out on a few trades in a row, then you wanna take that feedback, scale back and reevaluate. Is the market right? Uh, is the market you know, worsting? Um, am I just trading? Am I being sloppy? Uh, think about what's going on and often um, basically you should allow that to impact your actions and that will help protect you in the long run. So basically you want to practice progressive exposure and trade your largest when, you, when you're trading at your best and the smallest when you're trading at your worst like Mark Minervini says. And this happens on the flip side as well. If, if the market you know, goes into a correction, you're stopped out and progressively you've been kind of pushed to cash then once the market starts to improve again, we get that fall through day or other type of signal. Uh, you want to put it on some pilot trades and see if they work. And if they do, then you can go ahead and increase your exposure and scale in rapidly if things really start working. And I think what's really important is you are never forced to trade. Um, nobody's holding a gun to your head saying you have to trade today. Um, you, don't, you never have to trade in any market environment. Focus on your own process and follow your own trading rules. And I think a, a great resource for progressive exposure is Anish Sikri's presentation uh, that he did. If you just search on, on YouTube, the art of position sizing, 
Um, he goes through practically how to use uh, progressive exposure to um, basically scale in and out of the market. Uh, it goes through a bunch of Excel sheets that are really handful templates. So I'd highly recommend checking this video out, uh, this video out as well. And uh, I think uh, lesson three, I'll, I'll just pause here. John, are there any questions in the chat that uh, I can answer right now? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, so there's, there's one question. People want to know what baseball position do you play? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, so I, I was an infielder. So I played third base, shortstop, second base, and I also pitched a bit. Uh, but primarily shortstop and third base were, were my main two. Okay. Uh, and people just wanted to know if the recording will be shared with participants. Yes, the, the link that I gave at the beginning of the uh, chat is got the link. We will post there the video probably in about a day or two. Um, and I believe, Richard, you will give us these slides we can post to as well. Yeah, and I'll, I'll share a link at the very end of the presentation. You can you can download it right from that link. But I'll, okay. I'll shoot them your way as well so you can put them on uh, the Meetup site. Perfect. Yep. Um, and he asked what uh, somebody asked, George asked, what YouTube channels do you watch? Yeah, so um, I definitely watch IBD's YouTube channel. Um, I think, um, let's see, uh, Financial Wisdom has a really cool trading uh, YouTube channel. Um, I'm pretty selective when it comes to the trading content YouTube channel. Some of, some of the people just don't approach it in a similar way as me, like emphasizing risk management, uh, focusing on, you know, just making money and, and the benefits, but not really uh, the negatives. So, um, yeah, I'll think of that. Maybe I'll make a tweet later on expanding on that and, and throwing out a list. But there's definitely some good ones out there. Patrick Walker's, I think, is really good. Mission winners. Um, let's see. Uh, Jack Alpha Charts is pretty good as well. Ben Pattern Profits on, on, on Twitter. He has got a YouTube channel. So uh, there's definitely a lot of great resources out there now. Uh, and uh, John, of course, I really like your uh, market updates. I think those go really in depth and, and they're really great. So maybe I'll push you to post once a week. I know that's a, that's a big ask, but that'd be really cool. <laughs> okay. Excellent. All right. Well, let's, let's continue and then we'll collect some more questions. Sounds good. All right. So moving on to lesson four, which is focus only on high potential stocks. Uh, so this this can look very differently depending on your style, right? So if you're a dividend investor, the same stocks aren't going to be the same as a growth investor. Um, so everybody here is probably pretty much looking for the same thing, true market leaders um, following the can slim methodology. And I kind of view this in two different ways. There's stocks that are leaders that are just kind of showing superior price action and, and strength and uh, not necessarily, they, they don't necessarily have the sales growth earnings uh, that make them qualify as a true market leader, but they're also a leader in terms of price. So uh, you can have those price leaders or those true market leaders. And ideally, a setup comes together where you've got both. And that, that's where you can really make a lot of money. And I think Tesla back in 2019, 2020 is a great example of this. It had that price out performance, this huge run from the earnings gap up in 2019. And then it set up that super nice base uh, that led to that uh, super strong 2020. So when you get both coming together where the price action is that 99th percentile and you've got the earning sales, the story, uh, the, the group working as well, that's when you really want to focus and try to concentrate in these type of names. Um, and basically in terms of identifying those high potential stocks, you want to look for significant signs of accumulation. So uh, huge gap ups on volume, uh, respect for moving averages, tight price action, um, clean bases, uh, that type of thing. And ideally, you want to look for early stage bases, uh, the IPO base or the first constructive base um, consolidation after a strong uptrend. Those uh, lead to the majority of true market leaders. And they. you also want to look for leading stocks and leading groups with a strong story, breakout sales growth, earnings growth, estimates, increasing fund ownership, all those can slim characteristics. Um, and the long-term trend of the price action uh, should also be increasing. So I like to look for stocks and focus on stocks above their 200-day moving averages in strong uptrends. And uh, that's kind of the recipe for a potential true market leader. And for those people who love to screen, uh, these are kind of three example screens that you can take and, and tweak uh, looking for fund ownership, earnings growth, sales growth. And you can take this, add criteria, take stuff away. Uh, these are really just kind of ideas to get you going. But uh, this looks for kind of three different buckets of stocks that really can can uh, be true market leaders and, and outperform the market. All right, so diving a little bit deeper into using charts to identify setups and time trades. 
Um, every single one of the top traders who I've interviewed uh, use charts, uses check technical analysis to not only kind of look for stocks that have, have that high potential, but also to identify setups where they can manage risk tightly and put on the size. And that's what really leads to that performance, timing that, that trade properly. And uh, you want to basically look for standout relative strength and institu institutional footprints, as I've already kind of mentioned. And as traders, we basically want to leverage both time and money. We don't necessarily want to be sitting through uh, you know, a, a pullback all the way down to the 30-week moving average if you're a short-term trader. Uh, if you're a longer-term trader, maybe. Uh, but we basically want to be entering a time where we have a high chance of seeing appreciation in our capital rapidly. And we want to enter at a specific point, a pivot point, where a large directional move is expected and you know exactly the point where the setup fails. So that's really key. That allows you to manage risk really tightly. And the goal is either to be in a profit immediately or to be stopped out very quickly. So you can either you know take a step back, look for another opportunity, or if that same stock, you know, the, the chart didn't break, it just kind of failed that expectation. If it sets up again, then you can give it another go. And this is why it's really key to kind of master repeatable setup. And we'll go through a few different kind of suggestion suggestion setups here, but pullbacks to moving averages, uh, base breakouts, um, earnings gap ups, those type of setups really allow you to, to key in on charts and enter at those specific pivot points. Um, and I think I, this, I believe this super strongly. I don't think I have to convince anybody in this room, but chart reading can help both traders and investors of any time frame. Uh, you can use stage analysis. And I think this is really important to remember at the end of the day, only price pays. So uh, that's why we use charts to, to analyze stocks as well as to timer entries and exits. Uh, so going a little bit deeper into why to use charts, uh, basically we can use charts to analyze supply and demand, look for institutional footprints and size of accumulation, uh, clearly define both stop loss area and profit taking area and have that defined risk reward. And they allow us to analyze the trend on different time frames. Are you trading with the wind at your back? Um, and you don't want to just look at that stock. You also want to look at um, the overall sector industry group and have all those kind of probabilities increasing the potential for that trade. And I thought this is a really good quote. I think JT actually pointed this out as, as one, of, one of his favorite from that interview. Uh, the closer you can get your indicators to what to that which is creating the profits and creating the risk, the more you can control things and run a tighter ship. So I think that's really um, a great way to summarize it. All right, so getting into some example setups. Uh, first things first, we've got the earnings gap up and this is that Tesla run back in 2019. Uh, we've got this breakout from a longer term consolidation. We don't see it to the left here, uh, but it was basically declining, then entered a stage one. And you can see all the moving averages confer converged here, the 200 day moving average. And we had a super strong breakout on extremely high volume compared to uh, that consolidation, that pullback. And this black dot basically means that this is the largest volume in the past uh, 12 months. So extremely high volume. And we not only got high volume that first day, we got follow on volume, basically just as high. That really showed uh, shows that institutions were kind of piling over themselves um, to you know, build positions, something had changed in the outlook of Tesla and institutions really wanted in. And from there, we had a nice clean trend, uh, respected that 21 EMA, a nice shallow pullbacks, and that led to that super strong run back in 2019. Um, and that's kind of what you want to look for for those earnings gap ups, huge volume, good closing range. And then you can enter, you know, either that day, the next day, or as it kind of makes consolidations uh, shortly after that earnings gap up. So that's one of the repeatable setups that um, I would definitely look look further into, research and study for yourself. Um, and here's another one. We've got UPST uh, back in, um, I think 2021, I think August, 2021, we had this huge gap up once again from a consolidation, volume huge, much larger than during this consolidation. And then we've got that pivot, which is that close from that day. And from there, on, then on, it went on a really nice run uh, before having a gap down and, and starting the downtrend that we have today. Next up, we've got the IPO based breakout. This example with PLTR back in 2020, uh, which started pretty much day one. We had this consolidation, then a volatility contraction pattern, ending up with a pivot, which is that IPO based pivot, as well as you could sneak yourself er in early here inside day right here through these highs or even kind of this weekly pivot right here. Um, nevertheless, wherever you bought this, it pr pretty much worked out right away. Uh, really nice trend. And basically I think it shot up 
100, 200 percent in just a few weeks, and and this was a really explosive move. Obviously, the market backdrop helped a, a ton with this one, uh, but you can also look at recent examples: uh, Zim, BRCC, uh, Corsair had another IPO based breakout uh, pretty much during the same time frame, and there's plenty of other examples going back uh, pretty much every year. Next up, we've got an early stage base breakout. This is Shop. Um, I'm not sure what year this is from, maybe 2016, uh, but it had a nice uptrend after consolidation, then an, an early stage base, nice nice lent to this as well. And then you can work your way in early up the right-hand side through this short-term flag, again in a little bit earlier than the standard base pivot. And this had a beautiful trend, um, basically you know, appreciating quite quickly and, and basically starting the trend that we know uh, know now that ended up over well over a thousand dollars. And this was a super strong move, a nice volume coming in on that base breakout. Um, and you could have worked yourself in a little bit early uh, through that um, short term flag here, that handle up the right hand side of the base. Lastly, we've got the high tight flag, and this is apps back in 2020. Uh, once again, we had an earnings break, uh, earnings gap up here on the highest volume in the past 12 months. That started a super strong trend, and then we pulled back tightly into that 21 EMA. And we also had a DTL confluence here and then a really nice breakout. And you can see the volume come in on this breakout. And then once again, another earnings gap up. So uh, this is a really powerful pattern. Uh, doesn't there, There's not always uh, some that you know present themselves in every market environment, but when they do show up, uh, they can be extremely powerful and lead to some super powerful moves. So we've kind of got a, a combination here. We've got the earnings gap up showing that strength, showing that accumulation, and then it sets up a, another add-on pattern or initial pattern and really takes off from there. Uh, so before we move on to lesson five, I know I went through a bunch of examples there. So any questions on those? Let's see. A um, couple things. Um, mm -hmm. Someone asked, you know, how successful have you been with GLB? So you'll have to explain that. I believe that's green line breakout. Yeah. Yeah. So a GLB is uh, Dr. Eric Wish's base breakout. It's, it's basically like a standard pivot where a stock makes a new all time high then rest for at least three months. Uh, so this one was Shopify, Shopify uh, probably was pretty close to a GLB. It's definitely in the spirit of a GLB. I think we we kind of overshoot this pivot right here, uh, but basically it's a, it's a base, base breakout after a nice consolidation. And th they definitely work. I like to work myself in a little bit earlier than that true breakout. I find I can manage risk a little bit tighter or after a stock has had a GLB, I love to enter on a tight consolidation um, or kind of a, a, the, the next pullback to that pivot, a, a different support area, or you know the 21 EMA, 50 SMA, that type of thing. So uh, definitely something I look for, and I love trading stocks right near that GLB because they can really be explosive coming out of it. Good. Um, here's a question from Francisco. Um, mm -hmm. Can you share your trading, batting average, expectancy, or any other interesting progression of your statistics during your trading journey? Yeah, so um, my historical batting average is about 42%, I think. Um, definitely my average gain is a lot lower in 2021, 2022 than it was in 2020. Uh, but I've also tightened up the risk management a, a lot as well. So I used to, I think my average loss used to be 4.5%. Uh, I think over the, the, the next few years, I've kind of tightened that up to around you know, 3.2%, 3.3%. So I've kind of shortened my time frame a little bit. And um, so that that's pretty much what I, what I can say about that is um, overall batting average about 42% and kind of tightened up both those average gain and average loss over the past two years. Uh, but the market environment has, has sued that a little bit more rather than going for those longer term trends. And so follow up is, you know, do you, you must obviously be monitoring these um, and, and they wanted to know, is there any particular tool that you're using to monitor those kind of statistics? Yeah, no, nothing fancy. Um, I've got an Excel template that I kind of do manually. Um, I tried setting up like a Python program to kind of um, streamline everything. That, that actually didn't make things easier. So um, I think Excel is a tool that everybody's got or Google Sheets that works as well. Um, it doesn't have to be complicated. I, I think just find what works for you and, and um, that, that something that you'll actually do. I think that's the most important thing is uh, don't, don't make it a hassle to enter your your trades, make it as easy on yourself as possible. Okay, great. And uh, correspondingly, people said if you're keeping your losses to three or four percent, 
um, you know, what's your what's your multiple in terms of average gain? Are you a two to one trader, a three to one trader, five to one trader? Yeah. Yeah, I'm always shooting for that five to one trader, but uh, I, I think I'm more like a 2.2 trader uh, right now. So more 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 the swing trade side of things than looking for those big position trades. Um, I think uh, in 2020, it was close to a three to one. I think it was maybe a, a 2.9, 2.8 or something. Uh, but I'm more of a 2.2 and then, and then, yeah, that batting average about 40, 42, 43%. Okay, great. Great. And somebody asked, uh, when we can move on in a second, somebody asked, will you do an interview with, and I'm going to pronounce this wrong, Kuala Magi? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Christian. Yeah. I've chatted about him, uh, about it, but, um, yeah, I think we just have to set a date and, and sometime that he's free. I, I'm definitely open to it. Uh, I've reached out to him. He just kind of has to get back to me and, and set a time and, and we'll get done. Great. Great. I'll let you continue. Awesome. So moving on to lesson six, which is managing risk tightly and using stop losses. Uh, so basically your stop loss should be placed where the setup fails. Um, if you're buying on a breakout and it kind of fails that pivot, uh, reduce or, or sell your position entirely depending on your time frame, how quick you are in the markets. Um, and you also want to make sure you're using position sizing uh, to limit those equity losses to small fractions of your account. Uh, for beginners, 0.5 to 1%. Um, if you're more advanced and like to size up a little bit, you can definitely open that up. Uh, but I think that comes with experience. You'll, you'll kind of find what works for you, uh, your, your kind of comfort level when it comes to taking risk. Um, and I think it's really important is that if you cannot manage risk, don't, th don't take the trade. I'll repeat that. If you cannot manage risk, don't take the trade. Uh, no FOMO allowed. Um, and per position, the best traders I've interviewed usually keep stop losses on their individual positions under 5%. Um, and uh, often they, they cut losses a lot shorter than that kind of recommended 7 8% that Bill talks about in his book. Um, also, on average, this kind of getting back to what we were just talking about, uh, cut losses a fraction of your average gain, uh, shooting for, you know, two to one or higher risk reward uh, ratio that builds in a lot of failure when it comes to your batting average. And this table over here, I think, does a great job of kind of reminding us why it's so important to keep those losses as small as possible. If we take a 5% loss, it only takes a 6% gain to get back to break even. That's very doable. Uh, but if we let that draw down, you know, to 30, 35%, we're needing a substantial increase in that stock to just get back to where we were. And this not only applies to an individual position, uh, it really applies to your overall account as a whole. You want to limit your drawdowns as much as possible during those pullbacks, the, those corrections, um, and keep them, you know, maximum of, around 10% losses. And that allows you to really get back to break even pretty quickly once that new uptrend begins. And you're not just kind of spending all your time, you know, churning, trading, just trying get, getting to back where you were. Instead, during that next uptrend, you can take advantage of it and um, just work on compounding your account. Um, and it's really important because if your overall account takes a 50% drawdown, you have to double just to get back to where you were. And that takes a lot of time. Uh, so really try to keep those losses as small as possible. All right. So getting into lesson seven, um, establishing routines and practice, practicing discipline. Um, every single one of the, the people I've interviewed have a well-defined daily and week, weekly routine that they've kind of developed over the years. Uh, for that weekly routine, you want to do market analysis, uh, analysis on your previous trades. Uh, you want to go ahead and look at a bunch of stocks, what's working right now, uh, what overall groups are acting well, what groups are leading. Um, then you want to go ahead and build that focus list and focus on the best of the best setups for your particular style. So once again, depending on where whether you're an investor, swing trader, dividend investor, uh, the, the best of the best setups are going to, you know, they're going to differ. Uh, but for your style, focus on the top, you know, one or even 0.01% of opportunities. Um, and what's really important is on the weekend, you want to go ahead and visualize and kind of think about uh, what what is the stock going to have to do to put get me interested and actually have me start position. You want to outline your entries, uh, where you're going to put your stop loss, uh, your overall risk, your portfolio, position sizing, all of that you can decide on the weekends before you even, you know, before the, the morning bell even rings on Monday morning. Um, all of that can be decided in advance. So when you're actually going ahead and um, and actually training during the day, it's all about execution. You've already got it written down on a piece of paper or uh, just mentally in your head. You've already made that decision. So you just have to look at the information and decide whether you want to enter or not. And uh, then all of it just kind of following your process that you've already uh, thought out ahead of time. 
Um, additionally, going to the daily routine, you want to practice situational awareness. Uh, once again, you want to visualize anything that can happen with uh, the names on your focus list as well as your portfolio and think of how you're going to respond to that. So if this, then that. Um, if it breaks the 21 EMA, am I going to sell intraday or am I, or am I going to wait for the close? Think about all those decisions beforehand so you're not letting kind of emotions take control during the training day and and uh, cause you to ignore your rules and make something that uh, and do something that you'll regret um, going forward. So I think that's really key. And situ going back to situational awareness, um, think about where we are in the market cycle. Think about whether we're in a correction, uptrend, downtrend. Um, have we been up strongly for five, six, seven days in a row? Uh, if so, maybe you kind of missed the best risk reward spots um, in the market recently. So you don't want to put on too much size here uh, because there might just be kind of a natural pullback, which would stop you out. Uh, additionally, on the flip side, if we're down six, seven, eight days, uh, think about potentially looking for reversal entries, oops, reversals, that's everything. If you're a short-term trader, think about all these things kind of in advance um, and what can happen with the market uh, positions you're, you're currently in or, you know, ideas that you're looking to enter um, in the, in the next few days. Um, moving forward, I think it's also really important to try to focus as much as possible your focus list. Um, I, I, I would suggest less than five names. Um, and this, this can definitely differ based on how well you use alerts, how well you can track multiple names. But I found that focusing on less names allows me to execute better and just kind of overall execute my strategy a lot better. And everything else in the market is noise. So uh, once again, Twitter, if you're, if you're seeing somebody post this ticker and it wasn't on your focus list, it wasn't on your weekly universe list, um, then you're not prepared to take that trade. So focus on the names that you've prepared for and that will lead you to a lot better uh, performance in the long run. Also moving on, you wanna go ahead and set alerts just before key pivots in your daily routine. Uh, that way you can go ahead and actually look at the charts as the stock is approaching that key level and have it up on your screen so you can take in all the information, you've got time to enter in the order, and then all, all that's left is just to go ahead and execute and um, ideally, you know, get, get good costs on all your setups and, uh, you know, fulfill your plan. Uh, lastly, in terms of the daily routine, after the market is closed, uh, you can review trades, pick top setups for the next day and do everything all over again. And I really like this quote here. Discipline is the bridge between goals and accomplishment. Um, I think that really sets everything in perspective. All right, let me get a drink of water here. <clears throat> All right. So lesson eight, sell systematically and objectively. Um, so pretty much all the traders who I've interviewed um, are, are always kind of tweaking out their sell rules. Um, they kind of say that this is the hardest part of trading. Everybody wants to talk about entries, but really this is the hardest part and also the most important part of trading. And the key thing is you want to go ahead and follow your rules, set them in advance and then follow them. And there's kind of two main ways to do this. You can either sell to strength as the stock is getting extended and, and pushing up or on weakness as the stock is kind of breaking a trend, breaking key moving averages like in this area um, of NEO here on this chart. And essentially you want to focus on your statistics. If your average gain is about 8% and you've got a gainer of 20%, um, that's getting a little bit stretched historically from your statistics. So maybe you want to take some profits um, and nail down some of your position and then you can ride that last portion for you know a bigger move and then sell that last portion as it breaks moving averages. Uh, but essentially you want to kind of try to maximize each trend, each position and ride it until it breaks expectations. And I think a great way to do this objectively is to use moving averages. Um, and I like the 21 EMA, this purple line here, I think is a great way to kind of ride stocks base to base. And uh, my kind of rule is two closes below the 21 EMA, I'll be out of my entire position. Maybe I've sold a half on that first close below it. Um, some people who have kind of a longer time frame use the 50 SMA, the 10 week. Uh, but the key thing is to go back and study your winners um, and apply your current rules to those winners. Um, and see how it performs. Is there something you need to, you basically need to change to tweak? Um, go ahead and study it and uh, try to maximize each of those trades and apply it to the current situation as well. And also keep in mind the current market conditions because if we're in a trending market, uh, maybe you can switch it over to the 50 SMA. But if we're in a more short term trading market, uh, like we're currently in, uh, maybe you need to cut it back even further. Um, and as I said, I don't really like to sit through bases. That's not really my personality. So the 21 EMA is kind of my guide. 
Uh, and I think that does a really good job of, you know, capturing the, the, the most powerful trend in those growth leaders and um, basically allowing me to ride it from base to base. All right, so lesson nine is concentrate into positions. Um, this is something that all of the top performers in the US Messing Championship um, have talked about. You basically need to concentrate into your best ideas and you want to size positions so that they will actually move the needle um, if you're up, you know, 30, 20, 40, 50%. Uh, but if they move against you and you're stopped out, you definitely want to, don't want to be taking on too much side, uh, too much size and, uh, you know, taking a huge drawdown in your account. So there's a little bit of a balance here. And most of the people I've interviewed take on four to 10 positions. And this basically gives you a couple different benefits. Uh, first, it allows you to manage things properly and kind of pay a lot of attention to your positions and make sure you're on top of things. And also, if you need to sell, it allows you to sell pretty much all of them very quickly, especially as retail traders. So it gives you a lot of flexibility here. Um, additionally, it allows you to learn how each stock trades, learn the character of a stock. So you're able to recognize when there is that change in character and you might need to sell the position. And the benefit of this is just a few strong trades can really make your year. Um, if you get a few, you know, 50% moves in, in a stock that's um, 15, 20% of your portfolio, that's really going to move the needle and give you a really nice year overall. Um, but on the flip side, as I mentioned, you really have to manage risk tightly uh, to make sure that if you're getting stop loss hits, uh, nothing is kind of nothing too detrimental is happening to your account. All right. So lesson 10 is conduct post analysis, identify your weaknesses. Um, a lot of the traders who I've interviewed um, emphasize this, especially Mark Minervini, David Ryan. And I think this is as true for investing as it is for trading. You want to go ahead and study your game, fill, uh, game film, identify what went right, what went wrong with your different trades and ask yourself, did you follow and execute your plan? Uh, what were the common aspects of your best trades, your worst trades? What are your statistics, your batting average, your average gain, average loss? Are you cutting losses properly? Um, also think about what can you improve on? What rules and routines can you create to do so to achieve your goals? And once again, um, don't focus on other traders, focus on yourself, uh, focus on comparing yourself to how you were trading one year ago, two years ago, and just try to get that incremental improvement. Um, I know post analysis isn't always fun, but uh, you know, printing out charts and plotting your entries, exits is the best way to really analyze, um, you know, how, how you're actually performing and look for those kind of new ideas, uh, new rules that you can implement to really uh, push, push the needle and improve your performance. So I think that's super important. And once again, Juan Soto, um, all those top athletes study, um, they study pitchers, they study their swings, uh, they study their, their shots, their throws. Um, there's a reason that these athletes study themselves to improve and just be a little bit better the next time. Uh, so once again, here's another slide on conducting post analysis. Uh, you want to go ahead and do your homework. And this is kind of an assignment for all of you guys. Uh, sorry, I did pop quiz. I didn't, uh, you didn't know that you're getting homework, but you're getting homework. Uh, take your, take your last 100 trades, calculate your batting average, your average gain, average loss, average holding period for wins, average holding period for losses. And this is something that I first learned at Dr. Wish's class. And ideally you want to shoot for at least a two to one gain to loss ratio and look for those common mistakes and just try to analyze what you can do a little bit better, a little bit better the next time.